everyone. Welcome to the Public Art 101 webinar. My name is Liesl Fenner and I am the Public Art Program Director here at the Maryland State Arts Council. I want to welcome everybody today. We will uh, be going through several slides uh, describing the Public Art programs here at the Maryland State Arts Council. Uh, each slide will be showing examples of public artworks from across the United States. So it's really illustrating the range and diversity of what is possible for public space. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. So if you want to go back to the recording, uh, be able to uh, review the, the points and also to research the images that uh, we've illustrated here as examples, uh, you're welcome to do that. Thank you. The chat box is down at the bottom of the screen. We have Rosa Chang here, our special projects assistant. Uh, you're welcome to type in a, a question. Uh, we're going to try and take the, the Q&A at the end of the uh, webinar, but feel free to jot a question. Rosa will notate the question that we can review at the end. If you have trouble uh, automatically connecting to the audio, just click join audio down in the corner. You can also make your screen larger by enlarging it uh, at the view options. And if you need to leave the webinar for any reason, just click leave meeting and that will exit you out of the Zoom program. So, in our agenda, we will be uh, reviewing, uh, again, the public art programs uh, here at uh, Maryland State Arts Council. Uh, we have uh, two programs, the Public Art Across Maryland program, as well as uh, the Maryland Public Art Initiative. We're going to focus on the Public Art Across Maryland program. We'll be reviewing how to plan a project as well as um, how to select an artist, the RFP and the RFQ process. We'll be also be going through the PAM application um, and we'll be uh, reviewing key information that you'll need to uh, include in your uh, application if you apply. So the Maryland State Arts Council encourages and invests in the advancement of the arts for all Marylanders. Its grants and programs support artists and arts organizations in their pursuit of artistic excellence and ensure the accessibility of the arts to all citizens and promote statewide awareness of arts resources and opportunities. Uh, we had a webinar on Monday led by our executive director, Ken Skashesh, and I welcome folks to go back to that recording to learn more about all of our programs here at the Council. So the Maryland Public Art Initiative Program is primarily centered for artists to apply to create public art for new or renovated state buildings, state buildings in Maryland. However, the Public Art Across Maryland program is to support organizations that are hiring an artist in the planning and the creation of public art at the community level. And as I mentioned, this is primarily what we will be focusing on today, the PAM program. So it supports communities creating public art through support for community visioning activities and planning processes to develop a public art concept and then the funds to create the final artwork. So many people ask, well, what is public art? It's an accessible work of any kind that cares about challenges involves and consults the audience for or whom it is made, respecting the community and the environment. 
this is just one of many definitions, but the key component about public art is that it's free. There is no admission price to view it. Uh, there, it is accessible to all in public space. I want to just review, review a few key terms um, as we uh, are looking at different project examples. I wanted to talk about the different types of artwork. Um, it can be two dimensional, such as this project. Uh, we often, often talk about the site and that's where the artwork is located. Uh, this is an outdoor example and it happens to be a river. So again, I want to highlight, we can really think broadly about where public art can actually go. Uh, this was temporary. Um, it was installed for a period of time. Um, often this might be a festival, a weekend, a week. It might be the summer season. It could be several seasons, a couple of years. Uh, importantly here with temporary public art, the materials, um, it was required that the artwork must be able to float uh, for that particular site condition. Um, for temporary projects, typically the materials are less durable than a permanent public artwork. So we also have three-dimensional work. This is sculpture that's creating a gateway uh, on an outdoor bridge uh, at the entrance to a downtown. It is permanent. Um, it is uh, about 15 years old. It's a project I worked on many years ago. And uh, it is made of steel. Uh, it is part of this community's uh, celebration of their, their river and uh, the downtown gateway uh, to, their, to their shopping district. This is a combination of both two and three dimensional work at an indoor site, a public school on New York City. And it's mixed, this is the term mixed media where an artist has used multiple, multiple materials. Um, you can see there's, there's paint, there's uh, metal, the copper, uh, that is illustrating planets and then the cosmos. Uh, there's suspended glass, there's suspension wires, as you can see um, from the work that's out in the hallway um, for the children and the students to enjoy. So let's talk about the planning grants for the Public Art Across Maryland program. So we award, uh, we award $2,500 uh, to support the community visioning process. And this supports uh, the community planning the artwork goals, what you would like it to do, or the themes that you're seeking and the type of work to identify, to figure out where do we want this artwork. You don't have to have it figured out before your planning grant. That's what the planning grant is for. Um, it's to administer a call to artists. And we're going to go into great detail about a call to artists shortly. And it's also to support the artist uh, creating a proposal uh, at what we call an honorarium. The planning grant can also support a public art master plan, which is looking at the big picture of your community or downtown, perhaps looking at multiple sites uh, for public artwork and looking perhaps at multiple artists to create those artworks. And there are several master plans that have been done in Maryland, both in Hagerstown and Frederick. And these links again will be available for download. We have the second grant, which is the implementation grant support. These are up to $10,000 supporting the actual fabrication to the making of the work, the installation the artist's fee for making that work. Sometimes you might need to prepare the site for, in this case, the wall needed to be prepared before the mural was painted. And we wanna pay you for the administration or if you decide to hire a consultant to manage the project. We know this uh, takes time and we need to support that time. Now, just to note, uh, to apply for an implementation grant, you do have to have the artwork proposal. It must be fully worked out and you must have your artist selected. 
So before you apply, do go to our website. You might have already downloaded our program guidelines. Here is a link. It's right on the public art page of our website. The eligible applicant is a nonprofit organization or a city, county, or any public agency uh, in the state of Maryland. So for individual artists, you can't apply uh, unless you are affiliated with an organization. So if you have a project idea, I strongly suggest approaching um, an organization or an agency to partner with. I, I really encourage everyone to log into Smart Simple, set up an account, and review the application questions in advance. You can just create a draft. No one is looking at your draft. This is your account. Uh, you can look at both the questions for planning or the implementation grant, depending on what you will be applying for. So we're really planning to plan. So. You do not have to have figured out who the artist is. You don't have to have figured out what type of artwork you want. It could be 2D or 3D. Doesn't have to be worked out yet. You might not know where that artwork will go. Maybe you're going to decide that with the artist that's selected. You can even decide later whether you want to go with temporary public art first uh, temporary, I uh, strongly recommend as it can help build support for permanent public artwork, uh, gaining the, the support of uh, me community clear. members, government agencies, and you can decide, are we going to try and do it this year or next? Uh, you set the timetable for us. It also allows the time to develop, develop those artwork goals and themes. Are we addressing the town's history? Are we addressing uh, political uh, content? Are we addressing the environment? Do we want the artwork to do something? So the planning grant supports the administrative time uh, and the community process to answer these questions. So again, um, the primary applicant you are um, able to partner with another uh, organizational partner. Uh, again, perhaps there's another organization in your community that has done public art before would be a great project partner. Um, we encourage you to um, check out your county arts councils or your arts and entertainment districts. And the list is in this link. Um, and it is also helped, helpful to find out if there are already public art guidelines for your community. This is important research um, as uh, you plan uh, your public art project. The planning grant is very simple. These are the three main questions that we <coughs> ask. Uh, we just ask you to describe what your process is going to be. And through this slideshow, I'll be showing you uh, going through the various processes that you might use in your particular community. Uh, these also include community engagement processes and how you might select an artist. You do need to think about the timeline. What are the, the goals when you think you want to debut the project? And of course, the project budget for planning. I'm sorry, excuse me, the planning budget. It's important probably at this stage to establish a project committee and that committee will manage the project from planning through artist selection to installation and dedication. These are just suggested members of who might be on that committee. Uh, but we certainly don't want to dictate who um, is on your committee. It's, it's really a project uh, depending on the circumstances of, of the context of your community. Again, I've included a link to the county arts councils and arts and entertainment districts here. Uh, these are art professionals that you might want to include on a panel. Um, also, don't forget to include an artist on the panel. 
Uh, but that artist um, cannot actually be allowed to apply for the project. It would be a conflict of interest. But there might be an artist uh, who works in a different media who would be interested in participating. You can also have a second committee. The artist selection committee would only be involved for the selection of the artist. So that time, commit is, time commitment is typically two to three meetings. Um, you could just make a combination of the both. The project committee and the artist selection committee could be one in the same. Again, it, it's up to your community and you can figure that out during the planning process. You don't have to have it figured out beforehand. So the planning and implementation grants are reviewed and scored by a review panel. Uh, these panel meetings are open to the public and if you apply, we do inform you of when that public meeting uh, is held and it's, it's held by GoToMeeting. So you can log in and listen to their discussion of your, your application. Um, the grantees, um, excuse me, all, all applicants are notified of your grant status. And if your grant is approved, um, all that we ask is that you sign the grant agreement form and then the funds will be issued. Note that it takes about two months to get a check from Annapolis. So uh, if you need those funds right away, you might um, have to uh, look at other sources and, and uh, then come back to the, the funds that uh, you'll receive in two months following your notification. So let's review the artist selection process. There are different types of processes for selecting an artist. We're going to be focusing on an open call. Um, and there's two types, the request for proposals. You might have heard of the term RFP. There's also a different type called request for qualifications, RFQ. We'll be reviewing both of these. Uh, you might already have your artist selected. Um, we often term that curation or direct selection. And um, this is information for artists. Um, there are many public art programs nationwide who have uh, pre-qualified lists. So you're eligible to apply to be included on that list. And then when that program has an opening, they will notify you uh, of the public art opportunity in that community. So let's look at the request for proposals. It's, there's several processes. We're going to look at one here. The public art proposal um, is, is just exactly what it says. What is the artwork that the artist is proposing to create? Please, I'll let you out in a few minutes. The letter of interest is the description of, of why or what their qualifications are that they're lending to this particular project and why they want to work with your community. The artist's resume of their prior art experience and examples of artwork. So this would be photo documentation, uh, often submitted as a PDF, and we're going to go into those specifics later. Um, you can ask for references, uh, but perhaps, um, you know, with this first type of project uh, request for proposals process. This is a great opportunity for artists that have never applied for a public art project before. Uh, there's lots of great ideas and this is a way to get a lot of ideas uh, to consider what is possible for the site that uh, is in your community. So this is an example, one example of how a request for proposals process would proceed. The artist selection committee reviews and scores the applications and it's based on criteria that you as the committee uh, publish in the RFP. They need to know how they're being scored. The proposals may also be presented or exhibited for the community to offer input. Perhaps there's a gallery or the city hall um, where public feedback uh, can uh, be sought for input. And then the committee scores the projects, again, based on the criteria published in the RFP. One artist is 
is selected to implement the public art project and then enters into a contract with the agency or organization who is managing the project. A second example is uh, what we call shortlisting. So the artist selection committee uh, reviews and scores the applications, again, based on the criteria that you've published in the RFP. But three to four, perhaps, semi-finalist artists are selected and interview with the committee and receive honorariums for the proposal that they submitted. In other words, it's uh, like a competition award. Those semi-final finalists might present to the community. Again, this is public art. Uh, we encourage a public process. And then the artist selection committee would meet to score the artists. And one artist is selected and again enters into contract with the agency to implement the project. The second process is called as a, is called a request for qualifications. And it's really just what it says. The artists submit their background experience, their resume, examples of their artwork. Again, a letter of interest, why they're interested uh, in working with your community. A key component here is the references as well. But no artwork pro proposal ideas are submitted with an RFQ. The artist selection committee, again, reviews and scores the applications. Here, three to four semifinalists are selected for in-person interviews with the selection panel. Uh, the artists, again, may present to the community. And then one artist is selected to develop the design for the public art project. The, essentially, this is similar to hiring an architect or a graphic designer, perhaps. These are about creating a relationship with that artist to enter into a design and then implementation process for the public art project. This is an RFQ plus proposal process. So again, the artist selection committee reviews and scores the applications. Three to four semifinalists are selected and they receive an honorarium to develop a proposal so the artists go away, they develop their proposal, and then you schedule artist interviews with the <coughs> artist selection committee. The uh, artists may again also present their proposal to the community. And then one artist is selected to develop the design for the project. And again, that artist may also contract to also fabricate the artwork. I highly recommend this process. This is a great way to field ideas and to pay artists for their time in developing a proposal. So developing your RFP or RFQ, this is some key information. Every RFQ needs, RFP uh, needs to include. What's the project title? Just the working title. If it's along a riverway, name your the town you're in Maryland, it, need, it can be very broad. What type of budget are you looking at? Uh, the $10,000 grant amount uh, for implementation? Do you have additional funds in your community, additional sources of, of funds? Think about the project goals. Again, you're developing the, those goals with your project committee, developing the themes. What are we what are we trying to create for our specific community, our locate that particular site location and the history, the environment? Is there an eligibility restriction? Are we only looking at local artists, perhaps regional or statewide? I want to emphasize that PAM grants are restricted to artists living in Maryland, and the artist must be a resident. And then you're also including the artist selection criteria. We highlighted that earlier. So how is the artist being evaluated? It's their experience, uh, the background work that you're looking at their portfolio. Um, do you want them to work with the community? Do they have community building skills, engagement skills? Um, think about the artwork itself. 
how it fulfills the project goals. Um, you may review a project proposal, but it really doesn't have anything to do with what the goals of your project are um, that you might encounter. You want this project to be appropriate for your community and the site. And is it durable? If it's temporary, that might not be an issue, but if it's permanent, it needs to be made of materials that are going to last. Very important part of the uh, RFP or RFQ is the timeline. This is just a suggested timeline and I've outlined uh, the phases. So you would state the overall planning phase. It could be going over several months or years. Uh, the application submission date, we need to know when that application is due. The artist selection panel will review the applications. Perhaps it's uh, a month long process, month to month long process. And then the artist selection panel will, will, you need to set a date for when they will actually select the finalists. Uh, it's important to include the date of when the artist will be notified. The artist is probably juggling multiple projects, multiple commitments. They need to know when they'll hear back from you. If you're including a semi-finalist process, as we described earlier, uh, it's often suggested that those sem semi-finalists uh, meet for a site visit. They come out and meet with you and look at the site. Um, perhaps you also schedule a community meeting for the artists to meet community members. And then you set a date typically six to eight weeks from the site visit for the proposal development period. So the proposal would be due typically a couple of months after that community meeting site visit. When the proposals are submitted, you might want to exhibit them for the community to view. And perhaps that's a week or a month, it depends on your schedule. And then the artist committee meets and selects the finalist. There's a period for the contract signing. Uh, and following the contract, every single proposal that I have worked with with an artist has to go through further design development. It's usually not ready to fabricate right away. So factor in the design development time. This is really important. This is really the fine tuning for the artwork that uh, the final work that you're creating for for your community. There will be a, a fabrication phase um, before the installation and typically that's several months. It might even go into a year depending on your community. And don't forget to schedule a dedication. Um, it's really important to celebrate the completion of the project. So here's some key information to include in the, uh, the artist must include in their proposal. So you would require this for the semifinalists creating proposals, or if it's just an open RFP, you need to require the artist to submit drawings and renderings. It needs to fully communicate what they are proposing to create. And this includes the scale, the dimensions. Often we'll look at a sketch and you can't tell if it's three feet tall or 20 feet tall. So dimensions are critical. We need to know the materials, what it's being made out of. The, the artist needs to figure that out in advance. And what the colors of the artwork or the various finishes, depending on if it's metal or wood, um, these need to be articulated. They might be adjusted in the design development phase, but we need to know as much as we can with the drawings and renderings. A description of the artwork is important. What is the concept of the artwork? Um, what is the meaning that you've communicated in this visual work? The artist should, should include this in the proposal and how it addresses the project goals. The fabrication is important to include how it's being made. And if, if there's a community engagement process that the artist is leading. The artist needs to include their budget for creating the work and they need to include a timeline and that timeline needs to align with your RFP. 
So the proposal information that you receive from the artist, you are going to submit for the PAM implementation grant. So with that information, and just actually a pause here, a note about fabrication. I, I just wanna highlight here that some artists do create the public art themselves and they have the skills and the material that they're proposing to create. Often the artists will create the work collaboratively with the community. They might lead the overall vision for the work. And then the artists might shop out the fabrication to a fabricator because perhaps they're thinking about an idea but don't necessarily have the skills in that particular media. Let's say for this example, glass. Uh, they have an idea here for this gateway, but they need to work with a fabricator that has the expertise in glass. So this is a great opportunity for you artists thinking about materials you haven't worked in. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to buy all those tools um, and learn that particular craft. You can work with a fabricator. So when applying for the PAM implementation grant, these are the questions that we are going to ask of you. And again, this is in Smart Simple. If you create a, a draft application, um, you can look at these questions. You have to have your artist identified. If you don't know who your artist is, you can't apply for an implementation grant. Uh, there can be multiple artists partnered on the project. Um, we need to know who owns the project and who is going to be responsible for the maintenance. Maintenance is less uh, important for temporary projects, but there still needs to be oversight of the project. The project description, we need to know what the goals of the project were and, and how it's relevant to your particular community. Again, your timeline. Uh, in the implementation grant, we have, uh, we allow you to tell us when you think you will be at 50% completion. And then we'll have a check in. I'm happy to come out to your community uh, or do a uh, artist studio site visit. And it's really just a chat to make sure everything's on target and on plan. And if it's not, we have tremendous expertise to help you. And uh, we do recommend you reach out to us if you're encountering any hurdles in the implementation process. We really want to help you create this project. And there will be hurdles, and that's to be expected in public art. And we're here to help make the work happen. And in that uh, process, there's, there's going to be community engagement. We want to hear how you've worked with the community in developing the project, including how the artist was selected. We also want to know that you have the support of other organizations or public agencies. Again, if there's any permits that are required to um, uh, implement the project. We also need to know the experience of the artist and uh, the organization, how you're going to work together in your collaboration. Uh, this uh, can be worked out during that proposal phase as you work closely with the artist in developing uh, the specifics of the proposal. You also will need to submit, again, those project plans and renderings that the artist submitted. The artist, you might have requested the artist to make a few edits on those renderings or plans before you submit for a public art implementation grant. That's fine. That's up to you and the artist in your agreement. Um, we also want to see the artist's background information just to ensure that the artist uh, does have the background to, to fully uh, implement the project. Uh, this also might include uh, including fabricator uh, information. Uh, the project budget. Key information here, the implementation grant does require a one-to-one -one match. And so uh, we know that could be a big lift um, for some communities. But one-third of that match, so if you were applying for $10,000, $3,300, 
could be in-kind donations. Perhaps you get folks to donate the materials or perhaps you get a general contractor to help prepare the site. Uh, uh, that would be a service. We can go over in what in-kind uh, is. Um, but you don't have to figure out your match when you apply for the PAM application. So uh, that can be worked out later. Oh, cool. So both planning and implementation grants are reviewed and scored by a review panel. The meetings, again, are open to the public. Um, I should say all applicants are notified of their grant status. Uh, if your grant request is approved, um, again, you sign the grant agreement form and then upon receipt of the form, uh, we submit a check request and you should receive your check within a couple of months. Uh, I want to note that the implementation grant is split into two payments. So you receive 50% of the grant up front and then following the submission of your interim report. Again, you're setting that date. So you tell me when we're going to check in. And after that check in that, you know, everything's on target or we've, we've provided some assistance to help get the project back on target, the remaining funds are issued. So you might want to plan that uh, in accordance with how you're paying the artist. I want to emphasize that PAM does not support the purchase of existing work. So this is the, our program is intended to create new work to support Maryland artists uh, creating works with community for specific sites. So there might be um, a wonderful sculpture in storage that is looking for a site. Um, and those are great projects, but unfortunately, we are supporting the, the work of, of, of new work. These are our, our upcoming applications. So we have one in February the 12th. Uh, if you're thinking about applying for a planning grant, um, you have plenty of time before February 12th to, to consider those three simple questions. Uh, you might receive your proposals back in time to apply for an impl implementation grant in May. Uh, but I want to assure you, you should take the time you need in the planning process. We will have more deadlines in our fiscal year 2021, which starts July 1st. So um, that will probably be in August is will be our next uh, deadline. Um, you can receive a planning grant and an implementation grant in the same fiscal year, but you cannot receive two planning grants or two implementation grants. We know you have a lot of great ideas and we want to support them all, but we also have to look uh, broadly statewide and ensure that uh, we're spreading the map, spreading, spreading the funds across the map. So here's the link. It's on our website for setting up your account in Smart Simple. Uh, feel free to email me with any questions. Here is my email address. If you have specific questions about Smart Simple, though, um, we suggest that you email Tammy Opal in our grants department. And do invite me out for a site visit. Um, we are very excited to, to talk with you about what your ideas might be, how to plan your RFP or RFQ. So pop me an email and let's plan a meeting. So now we'll open it up for Q&A and uh, Rosa's going to help uh, field some questions. Uh, that one came in earlier so for the implementation grant, uh, can it go to the same organization that received the planning grant? Uh, yes, so that is absolutely, it can be the same organization. It can also be a different organization, but it would be great to see the same organization uh, continuing with the project. And can it include the artist compensation plus other support activities, materials? Yes, absolutely. Um, that, that's an affirmative. Uh, this slide deck will be available. 
um, and the audio recordings. So you are welcome to uh, re-review everything I've presented. Is there another question? Feel free to type any questions in the chat box. I realize that it's, it's a lot of information all at once. So is there a database of successful RFPs and RFQs that could be uh, referenced? Um, you're specifically looking at the basketball court. Uh, so I have some sample RFPs and RFQs that I'd be happy to share with folks. In fact, uh, we've just started our webinar series and uh, for each of our webinars, we're going to have uh, additional information resources available. So I will make a note to be sure to include a copy of um, an RFP and an RFQ. I'll also note here another uh, great resource is the Americans for the Arts Public Art Network, uh, also known as PAN, Americans for the Arts is in DC. And they have a lot of uh, downloadable information on, from their website. They also have an image database. So if you want to look at different types of public art projects from across the United States, in fact, I use some images from, from their database. Um, it's a great resource and I highly recommend you look at Americans for the Arts. Another question, can you have a state, oops, be, have a state or city grant for the same project. Okay, so state funds cannot match state funds. So perhaps you might have funds from uh, the state historical trust or uh, maybe you have it from our arts and entertainment uh, district grants. Unfortunately, uh, you do have to look at a different source. So it could be city funding, absolutely. Um, we also suggest you look at private sources too, private foundations or businesses that might contribute. Okay. Uh, we'd be happy to email the PowerPoint as a PDF. Um, please pop me your email and um, actually we will just send this uh, to the participants. So if you um, are registered, we'll uh, make sure that you get okay, that no, as a PDF. Cool. And then, uh, let's see, we have another question. Uh, yes, so we, the Arts Council, we publicize your calls to artists, your RFPs, uh, your RFQs, because we know you'll be looking for artists. So uh, we're happy to include this in our newsletter, monthly newsletter. Uh, get that to me by the middle of the month. We also can pop it out on our social media platforms. Um, if you guys are on social media, do stay tuned for, for RFQs that will be coming, uh, RFPs from communities around Maryland. We have another question from Marion. Uh, does the definition of existing work include existing projects? Um, so you have a project that was started but not realized and the grant would support its development and completion being brought. Um, I think we'd have to talk about this particular example, Marion. So let's uh, chat offline. Uh, it depends how much of the artwork has already been fabricated. Uh, if a good deal of the work um, is completed, it would probably not be eligible, but if you're looking at, uh, you're saying moving it up in scale, so perhaps um, there is an additional component and would require a separate contract with the artist, that would be eligible. So any other questions?
there's a lot of great ideas in the images that we have in the slideshow. And I do uh, recommend Googling the, the projects, um, especially this red ball project that you see on the slide here. All right, we have an artist question. Um, you're new to the public art scene and interested in applying for projects. What is the best way to find out about opportunities? So make sure that you're signed up to receive our newsletter. So just go to our website, scroll down to the bottom of the website, uh, enter your email address, you'll receive our newsletter uh, the first of the month. And that's how you'll hear about opportunities. I also recommend, and again, also sign up for our social and media pages. Um, we're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, I had a link in the slideshow to the county arts councils and the arts and entertainment districts. I know this sounds a lot of uh, very time consuming, but I recommend signing up for the newsletters that our county arts councils issue because they will include um, the RFPs, RFQs that they're doing in their community. Uh, again, the Americans for the Arts is another great resource for looking at calls to artists nationwide. Um, for artists, your first project may not be in Maryland. It might be uh, in D.C. or Pennsylvania or nearby states. Um, you're building your portfolio, so I suggest applying everywhere you're willing to drive or travel. Start getting your name out there. Okay, there we have another Oh, and uh, once the uh, application is submitting, submitted, how long does it take to approve the grant? So we have those deadlines, or we have those dates, excuse me, in the guidelines. We typically get back to you uh, within um, uh, six to eight weeks. And I think that question applies to Angela as well. Um, now, if you're an artist applying to an organization's RFP, uh, again, we hope the organization will include the uh, deadline for notification so artists know when they're going to hear back from you. So um, again, you're setting, you're setting that timeline. So another question, Marguerite, are there types of projects that MSAC is particularly interested in supporting? Uh, anything, anywhere. Uh, we, we are really excited that the uh, Maryland Public Art, excuse me, Public Art Across Maryland program, we, we actually just went through a revisions process in the last year and, and we doubled the grant amount. It used to be $5,000 and now it's 10. So the possibilities are, are really phenomenal. I shared some really interesting different types of site opportunities, you know, thinking about water, thinking about um, underpasses, thinking about spaces that we wouldn't necessarily consider public art. But again, we want um, this to come from the community. This is something that the community uh, wants and it's a priority. So um, start putting those ideas out there and I again am happy to come out. Often my first visit to a community, um, you know, I have first impressions uh, that sometimes I can share and say, well, have you thought about this spot when I drove into town? So uh, invite me out and, and let's, um, let's chat further. I also, again, um, just want to emphasize temporary public art. It's a great way to explore ideas, artists to explore ideas, and for a community to, if you will, get your feet wet, just to try out something that's going to be up for again, a few weeks, maybe a festival, a season, the whole summer, you know, perhaps during good weather. Um, it's, it's up to the community, but that can uh, gain the community support, especially the support for funding uh, for permanent work. So um, think possibly about temporary public art. Can it be performance art? Yes. I want to be clear, though. Um, 
it cannot be a performance. It cannot necessarily support um, musician fees for uh, a band playing their usual set. This has to be, again, work created for the particular community and the particular site it's taking place. So yes, performance art does qualify. So does an art festival with some interactive art demos qualify as temporary public art? Um, could you put in the chat what you mean by an art demo? I think that um, certainly supporting art work in a festival, as we just described, performance art or uh, interactive um, art that involves participation in some way of uh, a new work uh, definitely would qualify. Gel printing, mask making. Um, that could be part if let's say the uh, printing and the mask making were part of a larger work, perhaps the masks were, uh, or were people wearing the masks were became a performative compo component of the work. Uh, we can't necessarily support something that someone walks away with and doesn't, um, the broader community doesn't uh, get to experience that work. So we just want to make sure that um, there's, there's full public um, visibility and participation. So that's, Jim, that's a great question. I think, you know, there are nuances and I'd be happy to chat further um, on what those ideas are. Um, I think there's definitely possibilities within that. Decorative lighting, does, uh, lighting our ideas are fantastic and uh, definitely think about nighttime public art and yes, decorative lighting. Um, I think how that lighting is planned within uh, the community, um, perhaps again, you might, might need to be working with uh, public agencies, um, but also projections, um, uh, projections of video or uh, a static artwork that's projected, let's say, onto a building. There's lots of examples of uh, those types of public art projects and, and uh, definitely look into to those possibilities. Great idea. Uh, can it be support of projects with neighborhood participants, uh, such as children painting uh, for a mural project? Absolutely. Um, we encourage participation. Uh, we just want to ensure that uh, a professional artist is leading the project. So how the community participates is uh, worked out between the artist and the organization applying. But definitely that's a great uh, ownership when uh, children and, and youth get involved in um, actual murals or any type of public art making. Another question. Uh, can you submit more than one grant application? Um, so you could apply with a planning and an implementation grant, but you cannot apply with two planning grants. So really focus on one idea and uh, the panel will, will review, uh, uh, will review and, and score your, your application. Great question though, where I, I like to hear the um, possibility of all those, those ideas coming forward. So we have just a few more minutes if there's any final questions. Again, this will be available on our website for download. Um, for participants, I will email you the PDF. Um, 
I'm liesel.fenner at maryland.gov and we're happy to uh, talk further. And uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, come out for a site visit and discuss your projects in more detail. So it looks like uh, we've wrapped up the questions. And so I wanna thank everyone for your time. And oh, we have one more question. Uh, could a painting day uh, be a separate grant from an original project? Um, yes, I see that as a community activity that's part of uh, the public art project. Uh, perhaps we might just want to talk offline on the details of that, but yes, uh, participatory art making is, is definitely included as long as it's culminating in a final um, work that's, that's shared and enjoyed by the larger community. All right, thanks everyone. I hope uh, you have a great day and uh, do check our webinar schedules, a uh, schedule for the additional uh, series of webinars we have uh, coming up. Have a great web, have a great day. All right, Chase.